Okay, so I know this is a loaded question, but uh, I'll guide you through it a little bit because my, my question starting out is like, what is your favorite part of the Christmas narrative? Uh, which, if all of us are good little Christian boys and girls, we're going to say Jesus was born. I know, that's a big part. So let's take that to the side just for a second. Outside of that, what is your favorite part about the Christmas testimony? Huh? Who said drama boy? Cool. Drama boy is very big in tradition. It's not, we don't find him in the scripture, but we find him very much in the tradition. And like, uh, who, who is it? King and country. The drama boy. Man, that's a, that's a rocking one. That's a rocking one. What about uh, anybody, if you take from, from the, the, the Christ standpoint, again, that, that's more of a traditional standpoint, from a, from a biblical standpoint, um, like Mary's testimony. Anybody? 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 No one likes Mary. Okay, that's good to know at Christmas. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome, huh? Elizabeth, well, we'll, get, well, well Elizabeth, yeah, she, she's good because, uh, again, that's kind of pre-Christmas because she was part of the, the show one day. But, I mean, Mary's got a great testimony as far as, again, the, the, the young woman. Again, she's got to be with from 12 to 15 years old. Uh, she obviously was, had something going for herself to be so highly favored from the Lord, but also um, so highly favored that she was given just almost impossible task as far as social suicide, not sure what was going to happen with her fiancé, not sure what's going to happen with her parents, uh, losing, again, a, a social standing, uh, but, but just immediately saying, tell me how this is going to be. And she was immediately in when the angel came to her. Uh, anybody, jo Joseph, testimony? Okay, so we do have a Joseph. We have a Joseph fan. Nobody likes Mary, but Chuck likes Joseph. That's good to know. Uh, uh, again, jo Joseph, that's a incredible testimony. He's already made the commitment. He's engaged to, to Mary, uh, which in their time pretty much means they were married, except for they're not living together or having intimate relationships. But the commitment's the same. So that's why when he found out that she was pregnant and he was thinking about quietly divorcing her is because that's what it took to break an engagement. It wasn't like what we have engagement now. But, um, and then it's even amazing on top of that that he, one, had the... The, the, the compassion to quietly divorce her because he also had the right to have her stoned to death as far as how everyone was con concerned as far as her having criminal relations with some, someone else. Um, but for him to try to handle it so compassionately and then an angel shows up to him and says, no, this is of God and he leans in and once again social suicide, once again a lot of turmoil that's going to affect his business in a major way. Uh, from his carpentry, we, we would call it the carpentry that he did m more masonry today, but it would affect his business quite a bit. So for him to be able to walk so forward in faith in the midst of circumstances is, is, is incredible. Uh, what about, like, how many people just love the fact that she got to go on such a long donkey ride for the census? Anybody? <laughs> you guys don't like Mary, might as well throw under the bus all the way. Nobody? Yeah, that's not fun. No one wants to do that. Uh, census? Crazy town, book town, no room for an inn, nativity, any of that, somebody's favorite? Because it's still cool. Yeah, it's still very cool of just the turmoil, but how God works with it. And I think one of the things that's cool about that is that if Jesus was born in a hospital, if he was born in an inn or born at home or whatever the case may be, he'd just be an ordinary baby. But just the, the fact of how things went to match all the prophecy of the Old Testament is insane. Uh, and to be able to have such a, an odd duck birth in a barn, being laid in a hay trough, um, gave him such a unique situation that when the shepherds told the angels, this is how you're going to know what we're telling you is true, and that you're not just having a, a weird vision in the middle of the night as a group, uh, that you're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger, in a hay trough, in a barn, uh, because, it, because that's just the only accommodations it was for the Messiah, I guess. Uh, that wouldn't have been able to happen. Otherwise, I, so I love that aspect. The shepherds, if we're talking about shepherds, anybody shepherds? Okay, we got shepherds back here. Some of you guys, if you just, yeah, yeah okay, good. We got both shepherds, that's awesome. I like shepherds. Uh, I talk about them way too much. I know, that's what people happen when I talk about shepherds. Because uh, I do, I babble a lot. I love the shepherds. They were um, not highly regarded in that area and during that time. They were pretty much considered to be crooks for the most part because they would take and steal each other's sheep. They would take and steal... Uh, well, not really still, I guess it is, but they would let their sheep wander to other people's fields when they were getting shy on gr grass, and then now they're stealing from those people. So they, they were, if you remember, we talked about years past, they weren't even allowed to testify in court cases because shepherds were considered so untrustworthy. But yet God says, hey, here's my four witnesses. 
And so they're there, the, the middle of the night, the late shift, it's not even the guys who, you know, have gotten some kind of cloud or amount of time into the business that they get the nights off. This is the night shift, taking and having this incredible experience with these angels just filling, filling the sky. And I, I love, I, I th that's still my favorite nativity scripture is when, when the angels are, are saying, behold, I come and give you good news that brings great joy to all the people. I just, I love that. Um, Let's go past that a little bit. We get Simeon. I'm a Simeon guy. Am I the only Simeon guy? Angie knows I'm a Simeon guy. I love Simeon. Everybody goes, oh, yes, I remember when my parents would read me the story of Simeon during Christmas. Nobody? Nobody? It's shortly thereafter. I kind of expanded a little bit because that's when Jesus was dedicated in the temple. And there's this old guy named Simeon who has passed his years, but the Holy Spirit had promised him, you will not die until you see the glory of God. And so when Mary and uh, Joseph bring in baby Jesus to have him dedicated and trying to figure out where you go and what line do you stand in and all that kind of stuff, this old guy comes up, takes your baby out of your hands, lifts him up and goes, I have seen the glory of God, I may die now. That's a very weird moment if you're there. But I just think it's so beautiful. Right after that, the prophet Anna, you guys remember the prophetess Anna? She came out, she just happened, according to the scripture, which means the Holy Spirit directed her, to go out, and she starts worshiping Jesus, this baby. He's about to be circumcised. He's about to be made, made in to, to, to do the things that God's called him to be. I love that part. Is that everything? I was going to say, somebody's got to say the wise men. The wise men's in it. We, we put the wise men in it. How many people have nativities at home right now with wise men in it? Okay, so that was. Uh, again, <laughs> we put them in the Christmas story. They came about two to three years later. They weren't there on the night. Whenever we watch the Hallmark movie versions, they come in with their gifts, and it's neat and it's beautiful, and a little tale comes up. They came a couple years later. When you read it in Luke, it talks about how Jesus is a toddler at this point, that they see the child, not the baby, and they come and they give him these great, beautiful gifts that have so much representation of what Jesus is here to do. Um, it's beautiful. It's glorious. And for them to kneel before him, it's great. Everything from the beginning, is, it's just phenomenal. The Christmas story. And most of the time when we get together and we talk about the Christmas story, we go to Matthew because Matthew has a lot of the narrative of the testimony. We go to Luke because Luke has even more there as well to be able to go into it. But I'm not going to do that tonight. I did one on the table, but I don't want to do that tonight. If you want the full nativity story, as I said, we're not meeting tomorrow morning, but we will have a pre-recorded service that's on tomorrow, starting at 9 o'clock on the Facebook page, that will go through the nativity from beginning to end, and it will make you cry and laugh and feel things you've never felt before. So that will be there. But tonight what I would like to do is just focus in on John's telling. John's telling of the birth of Jesus is much more poetic. It's, uh, it's filled with more meaning, maybe from kind of a, a lack of a better word, a metaphor standpoint. Uh, and it talks a lot more about why we celebrate what we celebrate. So if you want to turn with us, we're going to go to John chapter 1. And I do not have your version up and running tonight. Uh, but if you do need a Bible and want to follow along, there are Bibles in the baskets underneath the chairs around the room. But I'm going to just simply read and talk a little. Because I want to put on the table not what happened, but as much of why this happened and why we celebrate it today. Sound good? Can you guys be in on for that? Okay, let's start out. Mike leaves the room. <laughs> Not kidding, no. Um, let's start with verse 1. That's a good place to start. And Like I said, we'll read a little talk a little. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Just start out there, there's two things I want to throw out to you to, to kind of take notice of if you've not been through the scripture with me before. First off, this is one of two books in the Bible that starts out with the words in the beginning. The only two that start within the beginning. John does that on purpose. Genesis was written long before John's teachings, John's life, John's salvation, John being a disciple, John being uh, on the island of Patmos. He does it on purpose because he's bringing us back to a very important truth when it comes to the, the creation. And so with that, he also, you'll notice uh, if you have the Bible in front of you, <clears throat> kind of a uniqueness when it comes to the word, word. 
that it's capitalized. And there's a reason for that as well. It's because when he's saying word, he's talking about the word, he's talking about a person, he's using it as a name. And so when we look at in the beginning, at the time of creation, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, who does he say the word is? Jesus. It's, it's, it's evident that's who he's speaking of. So let me, let me read that just again, but I'm going to replace that with the name Jesus to make sure that we're not missing anything here. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. So all of creation is made through Jesus. And now we could spend easily a three or four hours going into some of the theological depth of what John is trying to get us to there. So, so let's. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll stay on the, the, the surface code of it, but, but make sure you understand what, what, what he's saying, that Je Jesus was there, he is God, he was with God, um, and nothing was created through him. What that does, it, to me, is brings Genesis to life, especially Gen Genesis chapter 1. So when it says, when God spoke let there be light, and there was light. The word that he spoke was Jesus, and through Jesus was light. Does that make sense? When he said, let, let the, the waters and the, 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 the expanse and the land, let, let them be separated, when he spoke that, and then it was, it was Jesus who was the word, and through Jesus was that creation. And so all of a sudden, John's bringing to us, why we're looking at this little baby in the manger, who a lot of times we kind of make <clears throat> safe, uh, simple, um, again, childlike. He's saying there's so much more there that, that we so miss so easily. He's God. All things are made through him. The very words of God who brought existence is Jesus. Verse 4. In Jesus was life, and the life was the, the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now he starts introducing what happens after creation. He takes Jesus from being the word, and now he is the light. When you and I, again, just to bring it all on the table, when all of this was created, and, and, I, and I, I'm a simpleton, I cannot watch the Discovery Channel and not say that there's a creator. It just doesn't make sense to me. If the axis is off by this much, or there was something, I saw a video the other day where a mother humpback well with her nose, shoved her baby up in the air and threw her, and it flew across, and they're like, we don't know why it does this. But this is something that we're still studying to figure out why she does this. Is this playful? Is this more sinister? But, and and my, my thought was, I just love the fact that creation has so much purpose that we immediately think there's got to be a reason for that. I, I, I don't see that being accidental. I, I just can't. So, so through the creation of Jesus, through Jesus, who is of God, and the Holy Spirit was over the Spirit's while. We've got the whole Trinity thing going on here. And it's light, and it's beautiful, and it's what we were supposed to be, came the darkness. Right? Jesus didn't force us to love him. He, didn't, he gave us free will, and we chose, and we messed up. Uh, when I say we, I mean Eve. Um, and then Adam. And again, I'm not going to make any jokes, because I, I've said this a billion times. If they did not touch that tree, and we went through generations with no one touching that tree, I would have been the idiot who picked off of that tree, okay? So, so then came the sin, and now there was darkness. And all of that is thrown off. So now, this is why when we come tonight, several of us can't figure out why my back is hurting tonight. That's my personal favorite right now. Uh, why I'm going through these physical challenges. Why my family's going through this hurt and pain. Why I'm going through this time of loss why I'm going through the challenges of being able to try to figure out how to do Christmas when I don't have money to be doing Christmas, let alone paying the electric bill. I just, all this junk that's in our world came from the darkness. My body was created beautiful. Did you know that? And only the outside still is. Uh, the aches and pains I have is because of sin. It's because creation got corrupted. I, I still truly believe that the, the, the creation was created without tornadoes and without tsunamis and without forest fires and all those fun things. I, that's not God's perfect plan. That's creation cor corruption that comes into place. There's darkness. And the only way that I can go from me to God again is not by my own will because I am the moron who messed it up. 
and I don't have the power to fix it. The Word who was there at the beginning says, I will become the light. I will become the light that comes in to the darkness. I'm the one that will walk into the middle of it, take a hit myself, so that the light can come into the darkness. Now, I don't know about you guys, like, uh, even, this is going to be a stupid example, but it's most recent. Uh, how much do you guys really want to know about my family situations? <laughs> Kathy, okay, so, so Kathy. <laughs> <clears throat> Our dog was really sick Monday and Tuesday. Okay, so Jenny took him to the vet on Monday, and it all has to do with uh, digestive blockage. Oh, you, you guys wouldn't have said that if it was me. Yes. It's of my dog, and you're like, oh, if it was me, it's like, oh, stop eating so much fatty. Okay, anyways. <laughs> but so we, we got medicine, we've got exam, we had x-ray, we had 300 bucks later, you know, all, all this fun stuff. And so, so, so all week, um, he's been on mess, and he, he, he wouldn't get up. He wouldn't lift his head. On Monday, he wouldn't uh, have anything to do with anything. Slowly getting better, slowly getting better, but that dog would not do number two for nothing. So we're walking him a lot. And when he, we go out at nighttime, it gets dark out at our place. We, we're out in the country and whatnot. And I've got, this really wasn't planned. On my keychain, somebody gave me this recently. No. I have a Shepherd's Fellowship flashlight. Some company took and sent it to us trying to get us to buy some. Do you guys want to buy some, Heather? Yes. Okay. This thing doesn't do that much in here. But when you're walking a dog and you don't want to step in poop if uh, day, uh, days past, this thing makes a lot of light. That's what Christ does in our world. That's what he does in the world, but it's very focused and it's very beautiful. And I love the fact that it says the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness cannot, cannot take and overcome the light. Think about that today, depending on what you're going through. Verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right, you do not born with the right, he gave you the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. If there is a true light, it is telling us something else. There is a such thing as a false light. Depending on what you're going through, depending on the struggles, depending on the season that you're in, especially if it's a challenge you want at this time, there are false lights that you can follow that are not the true light, and they will always lead you into a brick wall. And I, I think I can say that confidently because I don't think anybody is going to be able to stand up in this room and tell me a testimony in the past when you follow a false light and you end up in, in, into the brick wall. Alcohol, false light. T taking and jumping back into porn because I, I've been anxious all week and this, I, I deserve something and I just need a, something for myself has never led you into freedom. Taking and getting into a drag out, knock out fight with your spouse never worked. Going back to an ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend who was abusive or not godly or was not caring to you has never led you into freedom. The true light, the one that we can choose, is the one that gives light to everyone. He's not for me. He's not for you. He's for everybody. And that's the possibility that we have. He came into this world so you and I can have light in the darkness. I love that. And the fact that he says that he took and continued into the, this world, and the world was made through him. He was the creator. John's already covered that. The world didn't know him. The world didn't recognize him. The world didn't honor him. His people who have been following him for 2,000 years, 3,000 years, didn't know him. But you, you can. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? I've talked to Jewish people who understand their heritage very, very well. And the thing that they've been through through the traditions through the years from the time of Exodus to now is overwhelming. Overwhelming. And God has been so faithful. And some will go to heaven and some will go to hell depending on who chose to be given the right to be a child of God. Us Gentiles have it so freaking easy. So freaking easy. Men, if you were circumcised, it's because of your parents' choice. It's not because God said, I'll kill you if we don't. That's how easy we have it. 
You didn't come to the Lord late in life and you're 35 and they say, okay, good, you accepted Jesus, leave and forgive you in your life. Get the knives, come on over. <laughs> we never had to wander in the desert for 40 years. We never had to go through the genocide that the Jewish community has been through. It was Jesus who came into this world to give us the light so that we can have salvation. If you acknowledge him with your mouth that he's the son of God, if you believe in your heart he died and rose again for you, you say, you're God, I'm not, and my life is now yours and you follow him, he gives you the right to be a child of God. Who am I? Who am I to be a child of God? Well, that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. This is how he did it, verse 14. The word, in other words, Jesus, he became flesh. The word, in other words, Jesus, dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and of truth. Verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, but Jesus has made him known. A little bit ago, um, Amanda was kind enough to read the book for the kids. Uh, I asked her to read that particular book for a reason. Um, and I think probably most of you guys recognize it, Lion, Rich, and the Wardrobe, right? Chronicles of Narnia. Anybody never hear that? No? Okay, it's good. It's good. It's, uh, did anybody not read it in high school or junior high? Okay. Never read it? Here's the crazy thing. I've told you guys several times before. I had... In my years back in like 83 through 86 or 82 through 86, how many years did it take me to get through high school? Uh, four, good. Uh, I did 11 English classes. I'm, I was never, never told to read The Lion, Rich, and the World Row. I came to it late. Uh, about 23 years ago is when the Disney version came out. Um, and at the time, we had the Christian bookstore here in town, The Shepherd's Nook. And the movie was big, and they had books, and they have music, and they have this, and they have that, and we're seeing the conventions and everything. So that was kind of my introduction uh, to it. it the, it's part of the Chronicles of Narnia, which is seven books total. Uh, it is the first one written, the second one in the series. And it is uh, from beginning to end. And the, um, okay, here comes, uh, look at me bragging about my English stuff. Allegory? Ah. For that one out of my junior year. It's allegory. Uh, for, to tell the story of Christ in the gospel. A everything within it is all about Christ in the gospel. Um, Aslan is, is Christ, is the fall of man that we see through Edmund. A lot, uh, the, the, the world used to be beautiful, but now it's not. It's under a curse, and it's always winter. Uh, all, all of it comes, comes down to the story of, of salvation through Jesus Christ. And um, I wanted to bring bring it up because as I've fallen in love with the story and as I have read it and as I have continued to follow the series as a whole, um, one of the things that I think I naturally took from, whether it be the, the book or the, the movie or whatnot, it almost seemed like the purpose of the kids, okay, so the four kids, was to be in Narnia and was to fulfill that prophecy and was to reign. Like that that, that was their, their purpose, okay? Uh, I'm not sure I believe that anymore, fully. I believe it was the role in that season, but if I'm looking at it from a Christian standpoint, the light pulled them back to where they started in the world that they were created in. In this world, they, were, they, they, they lived there, but they weren't citizens of Narnia, even though they were kings and queens of Narnia. They, 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 were, they were citizens of this world, and they had to come back when the light guided them back into this world. And so, as you know, and as you continue the series, you can see some of the parallels within that. But I've never really thought about it from that standpoint. But if that is true, then the lamppost becomes more and more important as I go through the Chronicles of Narnia. As, a, as I continue to think about the one thing that led them back to the <coughs> world world, 
Whether it be Lucy's first time there or second, always came back to the lamppost. When we had the time that we had um, them at the end, and again, I'm not much of a reader, so I'm going off the movie more than the book. But at the end, when they come back and in their mature years and they're riding their horses and everything, and they see the lamppost, and they can barely even recognize the lamppost anymore. They don't even remember what it's called. But according to what we just read with Amanda, the light led them back to where their purpose was. That I find to be beautiful. If you're going through a tough season this year, whatever it be, whether it be loss, grief, finances, addiction, struggles within the family, people who have walked away from you, people you have walked away from, whatever the challenge may be, the stuff that's lying behind all of the planning and all the stuff that you're trying to juggle and the things you're really not even trying to think about so that you can somehow fake it through this Christmas celebration. The light, the lamppost, is calling you back to who you are. It came to expose that darkness, not to try to have to muddle through it somehow. It came to call you and bring you to the right that you are a child of God. Not some kind of shadowy area where you're just trying to barely survive. You know, Jesus never called us to remember his birth. He called us to remember his death and his resurrection. But he never called us to celebrate his birth. We don't even do it on the right date. We do it with all kinds of traditions that aren't even necessarily showing up in the scripture. I'm jamming out to the little drummer boy, even though he never shows up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. <laughs> the reason I celebrate is this. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God and Jesus was God, and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And Jesus is life. The light was the, the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I celebrate because the word, Jesus, became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. We celebrate tonight because from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace upon grace. And if you've not in this moment, while you just ignore me, you can talk to him and say, I need you. I'm done. I want the true light, not the false light anymore. And you might be saying that for the third time today. Or you might say it for the first time and say, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. I need you to be my Lord. Everything else is shadows. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. I celebrate. <laughs> because Jesus has made God known. Can I bring the worship team forward?